Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name's Kylie Hayward. I'm the lead education pharmacist at SHPA. And I'd like to thank you all to, for joining us today for the launch of the Australian Commission on Safety and Quality in Healthcare's 2020 Antimicrobial Clinical Care Standard. I'd first like to start with an acknowledgement of country. So in the spirit of reconciliation, SHPA acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. And I'd also like to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you today from the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and acknowledge and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. So we have some learning objectives for today's webinar. Those are to outline the changes to the, the updated antimicrobial stewardship clinical care standard, describe the transition process from the 2014 to the 2020 clinical care standard for uh, hospital accreditation, and discuss ways to implement the clinical care standard. For those of you who are pharmacists in the audience, we have the pharmacist co uh, competency standards outlined here and also the accreditation information for today's presentation. So uh, I'll now stop and I will hand you over to Fiona to get the presentation underway. So I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the lands on which we meet today as well. Um, so I'm on the lands of the Gadigal people of the Great Eora Nation and pay my respects to their elders past and present. And I, expect, I extend that respect to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples that are here today. So thank you for joining the webinar today. My name's Fiona Dukas, um, and we're going to present the new 2020 Antimicrobial Stewardship Clinical Care Standard. Joining me today, and I'll introduce them a bit um, more, is Professor John Turnage and Dr. Catherine Davison. Um, I'm an AMS pharmacist, and my current position as a Senior Project Officer at the Commission, um, leading the project of this review. So I'm really excited and proud um, that we've been able to launch the standard this week. And I'm hoping at the conclusion of the presentation today that you'll all know a little bit more about the standard and that you'll have some really useful tools and resources to help with the implementation. Um, I'd really also like to extend my thanks um, for the support the Society of Hospital Pharmacists of Australia have provided in um, facilitating this uh, launch webinar today for the standard. So without further ado, I'd like to present our two speakers. Um, so the first speaker is Professor John Turnage, who is well known and well loved internationally and um, in Australia for um, his work in antimicrobial use and resistance and advocating um, for this um, and improving our systems. He's a senior medical advisor at the Australian Commission on Safety and Quality in Healthcare. And following John, Dr. Catherine Davison will be speaking to us. And Catherine is an infectious diseases staff specialist working both as the Queensland statewide antimicrobial stewardship program and in ACT health at the Canberra hospital. Um, well, first I'll just outline. So we'll speak a little bit about the why the, around antimicrobial use and resistance and where the place of this standard is um, for Australia. We'll talk about the um, process we undertook to update the standard go through each of the main changes and quality statements and indicators, finally talking about um, the role of accreditation from the national standards um, and then the Q&A session. So I'd like to hand over to John. Um, thanks very much, uh, Fiona. And I'm going to give you the background. Um, many of you on this um, a webinar would be familiar with the clinical care standard and its first version, which came out in 2014. This is obviously a revision, an upgrade, an improvement, however you want to look at it. Uh, and I think you'd also be familiar with the reason, rationale behind having such a, uh, a document uh, and for the commission producing it. Now, the commission's heavily involved in hospital acquired infections and antimicrobial stewardship, as you know and providing national leadership in a number of ways. So why do we need antimicrobial stewardship? Probably none of you uh, are ignorant of the fact that antimicrobials have been subject to both use and misuse over the 70 years of their lifetime. And it takes a lot of work on your behalf 
putting your stewardship head to make a difference. Um, so all of these things uh, in the uh, revised standard address the what, the why, the who, the where and the when, and of course, ultimately, uh, appropriate antimicrobial use is the responsibility of the whole society. Uh, and it's up to the healthcare professionals uh, to provide the guidance um, uh, to all um, who do that. And of course, we've probably been on this path nationally for nigh on a decade, uh, but there's still an awful large amount of <clears throat> work to do, excuse me. The other important thing about antimicrobials, having been around for 70 years, just about everybody wanted to have a go at them. Um, and that includes the use of antimicrobials, not just in human care, both in community and hospitals, community including aged care, of course, um, but also in animals, our pets, but also our livestock and our horses and all those kinds of things. And you'd be less aware about antimicrobials are also used in agriculture, particularly antifungals in crops, um, but also in aquaculture and beekeeping and all sorts of things. But the purpose of this slide just is to show you um, the data we have from England, which managed to collate um, in, in an effective way all of the data from all of the sources of human health, and to emphasize that in fact, the, big, the bulk of antimicrobial use is still in the community with general practice and specialist practice in the community, and, and that hospital use um, only makes up a small proportion the corollary to that being, of course, that all the uh, last line antibiotics are usually available at the hospital level. And these are the ones that require uh, um, extra stewardship activities um, to make sure they're used appropriately. So this is some of the data that we've been collecting through the uh, Antimicrobial Use and Resistance Australia program, AURA, uh, and uh, from the various programs, including the National Antimicrobial Prescribing Survey and the National uh, Antimicrobial Use um, Surveillance Program, uh, looking at appropriateness of use in the first case and volumes of use in the second, plus the data from the PBS and plus data from a, uh, uh, the NAPS program conducted in aged care tell, tells us which antibiotics are popular and you could guess that many of these are over-prescribed. Um, in fact, we have very strong evidence now about over-prescription, at least 50% over uh, of unnecessary use with these common antibiotics. Next slide. Why is resistance a problem? Well, Australia is no different from any country, any other country, and the fact that we have a growing resistance problem. It goes at different rates in different places for different multi-resistant organisms. Um, and even with the best of a skills we, and, and clever techniques, you can't control resistance the way you would like. And I will give you the example of restricting access to superfloxacin in the community through the pharmaceutical benefit scheme, which we've done very effectively, as a way of preserving the value of those antibiotics for the people who really need them and, and for related that and related antibiotics in, in hospital use for those who need them. And uh, despite the fact that the restriction, we still have rising resistance um, in E. coli across the country. It's been steadily rising now for more than 10 years. Um, and we think that's because resistance has this nasty effect of being linked. Um, so you have to control all antimicrobial use and it's just not the one that you're interested in, like ciprofloxacin. Um, the consequences of resistance infections, the most obvious consequences of people treated out in the community end up in hospital. Um, but of course, the resistant infections in hospital are then likely to be even more resistant. And we're familiar with antimicrobial resistance uh, in Australia, organisms such as hospital associated MRSA, which has been a problem in Australia for 40 years. Ironically, the Australian strain has gone away and been replaced uh, by, slowly replaced by one that's come from the UK. Resistance infections are more uh, uh, difficult to treat uh, and they end up costing time and money, expensive antibiotics, long stays. And of course, we occasionally 
encounter now the patient with untreatable bacterial infection. So there are a lot of uh, areas for improvement. These are through the uh, Aura Surveillance Program. Um, <clears throat> these are some of the things that have been identified in the hospital setting on the left, um, the uh, uh, aged care sector in the middle and, and the community on the right. And no prizes for guessing that the big target area is still up to this point, uh, uh, respiratory virus infections in the community. Um, but NAPS and NORSP have identified a number of areas that you can read on this slide. Um, and uh, of course, we're all aware now of just how problematic um, the age health care and the aged care setting uh, has become um, through even resulting in royal commissions. And we know there's a lot of inappropriate antimicrobial use in that Sydney in that setting in a very vulnerable population. So lots of priorities for us to get on with. Um, what process uh, uh, was gone through at the commission uh, to update this clinical care standard? Well, it was as detailed as it needed to be because of the critical importance of this area. And there was a review of all the more recent evidence, so six years worth of literature and, and wisdom of the contributors to the update. Um, so the initial stakeholders were then engaged, the draft was developed um, and an expert working group established um, that le led to a second draft which was sent out to endorsing organisations and as required by uh, under commission rules, um, all the jurisdictions, state and territory government health departments uh, were involved. Then there's an analysis of all the feedback received from the endorsing organisations and jurisdictions, which um, were then synthesised into the final document uh, and, the res and their accompanying resources. Next slide. So this is my transition slide to uh, pass over to Catherine. Catherine's an expert. She's so good she can work in two places at once, Canberra and Queensland. Um, and of course, she has a wealth of experience, uh, including um, a deep involvement in the evolution of the changes that have been made to that. So over to you, Catherine. Thanks, Fiona, Kylie and John for laying the groundwork. Um, I'm going to take over outlining the main changes um, and what it means for accreditation and implementation. And this slide is really just a summary of the main changes, but uh, too much to read there. So we'll take you through uh, the detail in a moment. Um, so this slide really really um, encapsulates the differences between 2014 to 2020. And we can see um, that there's uh, been addition of uh, a new uh, quality statement related to adverse reactions to antimicrobials. There's been an amalgamation of some quality statements into two, really about uh, review of treatment and broad spectrum antimicrobials, and also uh, shared decision making and patient information into five and seven. Um, and so alongside of that, we have uh, changes to indicators as well. Um, indicator 1A has actually been retired um, for reasons we'll go into in a moment. Um, there's been a number of new indicators, including um, an indicator outlining compliance with uh, restriction policies, um, documentation of adverse reactions, um, expanding the documentation of indications somewhat in quality statement six and indicator six A and B. And then moving through the uh, clinical care standard, an expansion of uh, the surgical prophylaxis indicators, including dose as an important element of appropriate prescribing. But if we're um, going into the detailed quality statements, uh, quality statement one conceptually remains similar. Um, we know that timely appropriate antimicrobial administration has been shown to improve outcomes in many life-threatening infections and optimal antimicrobial stewardship supports this concept. And so this quality statement forms an overarching statement really to be considered in the context of the rest of the clinical care standard. 
Examples, as we know, include septic shock, bacterial meningitis, necrotizing fasciitis, febrile neutropenia, um, which, you know, predominantly are um, hospital presentation conditions. Um, but alongside this quality statement, one, it's important to note that a sepsis clinical care standard is currently under development by the Commission. Um, and so this quality statement will be reviewed in parallel with this process. One thing I did like about the updated clinical care standard, particularly, I like everything, but um, a section was a, uh, added to consider the importance of end of life care um, and managing life threatening infections at this point of um, delivery of health service. And really the key point was to provide safe and high quality care that aligns with patient um, values, needs and wishes, um, including um, not administering life um, saving antimicrobials should that be the wish of the care um, uh, the family um, and the patient themselves. Quality statement two um, looks at the use of guidelines. It's largely unchanged from the previous version, um, except that across the clinical care standard, everything has generally been changed from antibiotics to antimicrobials. Uh, we know that compliance with guidelines, at least um, in the Australian healthcare setting in hospitals, sits around two thirds of all prescriptions. And we know that guidelines compliance facilitates appropriate prescribing. And so the purpose of this um, is to facilitate appropriate prescribing by the use of guidelines, um, including the spectrum, the active ingredients, the dose exposure, the frequency, route of administration and duration of therapy. With regards to the indicators, 2B is new um, and it measures re the restricted antimicrobials that are concordant with the approval policies. Um, we know that uh, antimicrobial formularies, at least in hospitals, have increased over the time since the 2014 clinical care standard uh, has been out and we expect this to continue in to improve to aid the use of guidelines in appropriate use. Quality statement three um, is brand spanking new. Uh, it relates to adverse reactions to antimicrobials. We know that having uh, great um, information, so the essential elements um, required to uh, really look at um, adverse reactions in their entirety allows us to improve optimal antimicrobial prescribing. Uh, this means, you know, the most appropriate, narrowest spectrum antimicrobial possible while ensuring that unintentional harms um, are avoided. This section uh, describes the components of adverse reactions to an antimicrobial that enable this clinical assessment. Um, and the detail is actually outlined in the clinical care standard if you want to go into that particular area to find out more. Um, so uh, we'll hopefully talk about that perhaps a little bit later. But quality statement four um, relates to microbiological testing. Um, it's um, to ensure that we're actually testing clinically appropriate uh, sites before starting antimicrobial therapy where possible. Um, and wording has been nuanced really to ensure clinicians are using guidelines to actually direct microbial, uh, microbiological sampling and testing, um, as we know that inappropriate uh, sampling does lead to inappropriate prescriptions. Quality statement five really puts the patient at the center of appropriate antimicrobial prescribing. Um, and the purpose um, of this clinic, this quality statement, which is an amalgam of two of the previous uh, quality statements in 2014, really aims uh, to ensure patients are informed about their clinical decision. They're informed about the, the options available to them, in including the not prescribing antimicrobials, um, and really to improve their understanding of how to take prescribed antimicrobials to complete courses of therapy to really improve outcome and overall reduce antimicrobial resistance progression in the Australian healthcare system. There's no indicators for this quality statement, but really measuring patient experience and outcomes really are where we want to head. Um, so if you'd like some more information, Appendix C outlines that uh, for those that are interested. Quality statement six is about documentation. And really the purpose of this statement is to support the effective communication among multidisciplinary teams, which we know improves patient outcome. And um, this is appropriate whether you work in the same facility or you work uh, in a primary care practice and are trying to communicate with the pharmacy down the road in the same suburb. 
As we know, healthcare records are complex and varied, um, paper, electronic, you name it. Uh, my health record, prescription records, paper charts, um, and they're all really should be relevant for um, documentation when looking at indicator 6A, which is the proportion of prescriptions where the indication is actually documented. Um, documentation allows the prescription appropriateness to be assessed by all the members of the team and ensures we can have accurate and current clinical information when required. 6B outlines actually uh, the duration stop and review dates um, that are documented. We know this is still poorly done um, and we know that many durations of antimicrobial prescriptions extend far beyond uh, the guideline based durations and so this quality statement and indic indicator is aiming to improve that situation in Australia. Quality Statement 7 pertains to review of therapy. This, again, is an amalgam of um, an and actual broadening of two previous quality statements. Um, the scope includes all antimicrobials as opposed to broad spectrum antimicrobials alone um, from 2014 and the need to review their need, ongoing need for use, spectrum, required drug, drug exposure through uh, dose and also route of administration. It's acknowledged uh, in this quality statement um, that's important to note that review requirements are quite different between healthcare settings. So in an intensive care setting, dealing with someone uh, with septic shock versus primary care where you're dealing with someone as um, um, simple as uncomplicated cystitis. Um, care will be different. And so there is a qualifier around patient acuity and risk factors to enable the contextualization of the timing and need for review of therapy on a patient um, demographic and presentation basis. Um, as I said, it's been expanded from broad spectrum antimicrobials to uh, all antimicrobials. Um, we know that the majority of antimicrobials prescribed are not those traditionally thought of as broad spectrum antimicrobials, and we really need to start focusing on them as much as we focus on others, um, including things such as Kerfilexin, um in our primary care and hospital settings. So this really um, ensures that we can narrow things as much as possible uh, based on the patient's um, individual risk factors. And quality statement eight really pertains to surgical and procedural prophylaxis. We know that uh, surgical and procedural prophylaxis remains one of the uh, most important areas where we can improve in Australian antimicrobial prescribing. And this quality statement now clearly encompasses procedures as well as uh, uh, surgical um, procedures to ensure that there is uh, clarity that this statement explicitly applies to community, outpatient, day surgery centres, as well as the hospital setting. Um, it also has some further detail about ensuring that prophylaxis is only used when needed and explicitly outlining um, that procedures often don't require antimicrobial prophylaxis and the indicators support uh, how we will deal with that. So the indicators for local monitoring, some similar to 2014, but specifically 8B being different, um, including um, specifically focusing on the antimicrobial dose. Um, but the addition also of indicator 8D, which has uh, been changed uh, to measure prolonged prophylaxis that's not in line with guidelines, slightly different uh, to the previous uh, indicator in the 2014 version version, um, really to focus on those that did and didn't require antimicrobials in the first place. Um, what does it mean for accreditation? Um, a very focused question that many will have in their head. Um, so obviously this does need to transition for the National Safety and Quality Health Service Standards. And as many of us know, 3.15D specifically refers to incorporating core elements and recommendations and principles from this particular standard. Uh, but transition is required. Um, indicators uh, won't be specified uh, on for a little time yet. Um, so in the interim, until uh, the 31st of December 2020, 
2021, um, you're able to use whichever version um, you feel is most appropriate and they will be made available on uh, the Commission's resources until that point in time. But really from 2022, um, assessors uh, will be, have been and will again be advised um, that really organisations should be focusing on the 2020 version uh, for the purposes of accreditation. Um, so that's all we wanted to go through today. I'm sure you'll have some burning questions and I'll hand back uh, to those chairing the session to take us from there. Thank you, Catherine. Um, so um, I just wanted to acknowledge everybody that contributed to putting today together and this year's review. Um, we've had nearly 300 participants joining in online um, at the moment. So first, my sincere thanks to the Society of Hospital Pharmacists of Australia for um, their support in co-hosting, facilitating and um, supporting the platform that we meet on today. Also, the um, AMS Clinical Care Centre Review Group members, of which Catherine is the chair and John was a member of, but there were many other people from across the Australian healthcare sector and the consumers that contributed to that. Um, my team at the Commission, the Clinical Care Centres team that helped with um, everything from content down to logistics and support, um, members of the community who provided feedback when we sought it for the revision. Um, and now we've had 25 key organisations endorse the standard. So um, for all the feedback and endorsement, just want to acknowledge and thank everyone. Um, so um, I just ask you now, there are a lot of people in the audience to have, if you have um, any questions to put them in the chat box um, and now. Um, but while you're thinking of that, we did ask for questions to be sent when you registered ahead of time. So I might just ask that one first as the facilitator's prerogative. So, um, Catherine, you went through all the quality statements. I was wondering if you could tell us a bit more about the background or the reason why um, we've added the new quality statement. So quality statement three around adverse reactions to antimicrobials. Sure. So quality statement three is a new quality statement, as you've alluded to. And really, when looking to revisions, we look at growing areas of new practice. And certainly, antibiotic delabeling is a growing area, particularly in mature antimicrobial stewardship programs. It's um, clearly being documented that it um, facilitates a reduction in restricted or broad spectrum antimicrobial use. Um, and, and really should value add to those who have everything in place to reduce restricted antimicrobial uh, and antimicrobial use uh, further um, in the Australian healthcare setting. It's not just in hospitals that it's important. We know in community prescribing, both in the aged care sector and, and general practice, that often um, what we are, I would consider broad spectrum Extramoral antimicrobials such as cephalexin commonly used, despite the fact that they aren't actually indicated in first line um, recommendations um, in. Um, the majority of uh, guidelines. And um, we really need to ensure that's not occurring because of um, allergy, uh, adverse drug reaction labels that could be removed from patients um, to enable people to get the most appropriate narrowest antimicrobial that is the most effective at each point of treatment for um, infection. Um, it, it really is, it's really about trying to focus people's attention on this particular area um, and allowing us to, as a society, to move towards um, these more holistic sort of care um, considerations when prescribing antimicrobials. The Clinical Care Centre has a lovely little box on page 20 um, that really outlines all of those things. Um, and, you know, um, as we know, this is uh, not done by just the people on the webinar, but, you know, has been in consultation with uh, medication safety and clinical pharmacologists um, to come to this point. And I think it's a really great value add to the clinical care standard. Thank you. I might stop sharing my screen and um, ask Kylie if she wanted to start facilitating some of the Q&A. Certainly. Thank you all for that presentation. That was fantastic. Really great overview of the um, update to the standard. 
So we have had a few questions come through. Uh, and the first of those, which is an interesting question, which is why has the term antibiotic been changed to antimicrobial in the standard? I'm happy to take that one. Um, this is an issue that's been rattling around for quite a long time. Um, that because antibiotic is used in all sorts of different ways. But of course, the common understanding is it means antibacterials. And of course, all of the agents that we use go beyond antibacterials to antifungals, antivirals, antithmintics, um, antimalarials, any anti product you can think of, except antibodies maybe. Um, and I think it's a really important to recognize also that as of um, a, a week ago, the WHO officially switched to antimicrobial as well. So I think the whole world is trying to change the message. And I think public is coming along with us slowly. Thanks, John. So our next question is uh, for any of you. Can the panellists comment on differentiating between indicator 6B and 7A? Does 7A refer more so to critically unwell patients pending micro or investigations, et cetera? I'll take that one if you want, Kylie. Um, so 6B is about documentation and ensuring that we can communicate. Um, and 7 really is about what you're doing with that review. Um, so are you narrowing? Um, have you thought about that? Have you thought about IV to oral switch stop? Um, and also communicating that to the multidisciplinary team because it should be documented, but, but it sort of extends um, what's happening at that review process, really. Can I add a comment? Um, so 6B was focusing around a duration or a stop date, but we acknowledge that not all people, for example, an acutely unwell patient with a life-threatening condition, you couldn't expect someone to put a duration or a stop date. So that's why you've added a review date as an option there. Um, so I can see how that would be similar with reviewing um, in 7A, um, which is different because that's focusing more on that review, like Catherine said. So the parameters that within 48 hours, we expect any microbiology to be back, um, route to be assessed, um, et cetera. So just to add that. Just had a follow-up question with regard to the antibiotic antimicrobial um, and someone's asked what about the welcome trusts reframe sorry everyone reframing resistance report finding which is <laughs> <laughs> i can't tell you that uh trent if you want to add in the the finding we can give you give you some more thoughts on that yes hi trent can you elaborate please quickly that the public don't understand the term antimicrobial? Well, I, I would answer that by saying, if you keep using it, they'll get it. It's not it's just a matter of time, really. Um, and it's a, then it allows the message for everyone in the future to say, well, an antifungal is an antimicrobial, and yes, the same principles apply. Um, and certainly a message that we would like to deliver to the aged care sector where topical clotrimazole is used like I don't know, lollies really, um, it seems. And a message needs to get out that there are risks associated with that too. It's really always a point of tension, isn't it? Um, who we need to message to and how we keep consistency across um, who we're trying to communicate to. Um, and, you know, I think it is important for clinicians to in, ensure that we are looking at all antimicrobials. You know, Candida auris um, has developed uh, likely due to um, large use of uh, antifungals, um, but maintaining um relevance to consumers. It's always a really hard um, goal, I think. I'll just support that by saying that um, we have a consumer guide that is a, one of the resources available in addition to the clinician fact sheet. And we've tried to use the wording medicines used for an infection, um, uh, but there is also an introduction explaining what John mentioned. So getting that language around antimicrobials into the consumer um, mind frame and also resistance. 
I thought that was a good question here from Sarah around evidence-based locally endorsed guidelines. So um, thinking about what does that mean, um, we've added that wording evidence-based to our quality statements as well. Her specific question is, what evidence do you think is appropriate to justify a surgeon's use of antimicrobials, which are different to the ones in the guidelines? So um, it might be interesting to talk about that, but generally, I guess, to talk about maybe what the um, standard defines as local guidelines. You want to start, Catherine? Sure. Um, so the clinical care standard uh, does outline uh, locally endorsed guidelines, um, but really uh, it, it's not just a piece of paper <laughs> that someone says, this is what I use. It's a system of governance oversight in an organisation, um, you know, peer review um, of the latest um, evidence base. I note someone asked about antibiograms and the clinical care standard um, um, includes that in revision of uh, local locally um, endorsed guidelines because there is a need for variety of guidelines across Australia due to the heterogeneity of resistance that's occurring in all areas of Australia. Um, and so it's really overviewing the peer review, um, looking at local resistance and then ensuring it's gone through an appropriate governance process in the health service organisation that you're working in. Uh, I might choose to add to that. Um, I have a, uh, a perhaps a stronger view of how we should approach all this. Um, it's difficult to put into words into the standard, but my view is that the reference document is the therapeutic guidelines. It has the brain power of about 100 people now for each revision. Uh, it's a huge amount of input, in not just infectious diseases specialists, by the way. Um, and that the evidence base should be there if you want to do something different to justify the difference. And that's why I think of locally endorsed guidelines as therapeutic guidelines adapted to local circumstances with the justification for the differences um, actually made explicit. There's a specific question um, from Kirola saying, prescribers use kefalexin 250 milligrams for UTI prevention for longer than six months because they are afraid to stop. What are your thoughts about that? So it's a bit of a clinical question. I don't know if... Um... Sure, John probably wants to answer that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think this is well, a bit of the cold, hard reality of it all is that it's not just the doctor who doesn't want to stop, it's also the patient. But... Um, you know, a sensible prescriber will obviously have the history of recurrent UTI in the patient. Was it just inconvenient UTIs or was it two episodes of pyelonephritis requiring hospital admission? Um, the whole um, history um, and any underlying diseases is the patient diabetic, now the other forms of renal disease, all of those will play into the decisions. And really the six month stop is just a message to everybody is stop and think, is this a really good way to go? Um, because the one thing we're perfectly clear of, and we learned this from um, uh, antimicrobial use in livestock, is that low dose, long-term exposure to antibiotics is the highest risk of all of acquiring resistance. So there is a downside and, and the uh, uh, prescriber and the patient both need to kind of come to terms with that and, and balance the risks. And I think, you know, that will be supported by quality statement five as well. If the patient and the care provider, when they're starting a prescription course, which in this situation might be six months, um, they are informed, they understand what's going to happen now, what's going to happen in six months time and what they're going to do after that event. So a patient is involved and has an expectation of, of the future and why things are being prescribed. So quality statement five really aids in the ability for the prescriber and the patient to feel comforted about um, what would be happening at the six months. Thanks for that. Uh, we've had a question from Kate around antimicrobials as intrapartum prophylaxis to minimise the risk of early onset group B strep. So around 30% of labouring women and their babies are exposed to this. 
Kate, did you lose? I think we might have lost the end of your question. Was there a... Uh, I, get, I assume um, she's uh, asking, well, is, it, is this a good idea or not? And again, okay. this is a, an issue that's been rattling around for about 20 years. Uh, various strategies for detecting group B colonisation wrapped up with prophylaxis regimens. But given the very low rates of group B sepsis in Australia and uh, the fact that this is single dose uh, um, in, in most circumstances, I don't think that the resistance risk outweighs the benefits. That's my personal view. Thanks, John. Kate did come back to saying her internet is uh, very bad, unfortunately, but she's just finished a PhD on this topic. Oh, okay. Oh, well, maybe she can update me. That would be good. <laughs> I might ask Heather's question. So for quality statement, yep. which is documentation of review date, in assessing this, can we include pharmacists and is boxing for review on the drug chart acceptable? So I think this is a good point for the AMS clinical care standard. It involves us all, yeah, uh, pharmacists, nurses, podiatrists, uh, dentists, uh, primary care specialists. Um, so um, in improving any of the quality, uh, the uh, antimicrobial stewardship and prescribing, it's about how you think you can best implement that in your health service organisation. Um, and if that's something that within your context of care, that will provide a solution and you can work through the logistics and the governance and the scope of practice um, for that particular issue, um, then you should consider it. Um, so it's all about working out what you're trying to deal with, what you think will give you the biggest bang for buck, what resources you have available, and what outcome you're expecting. And really, that will be different for all of our health service settings. Um, so, you know, thinking about what's appropriate for your particular area um, may be different. I was at the SHPA webinar the other day, um, and, you know, the Victorian, um, you know, pres pharmacist prescribing um, initiatives, you know, they're very progressed in Victoria. They aren't in other um, areas. So, you know, what is right for your setting um, will be what is appropriate. Thanks, Catherine. I've got a question from Alicia, which you may be able to answer, Fiona. Uh, will there be an audit tool developed for the standard? Yeah, so like I mentioned, we've got some resources that are under development but also currently published. So currently published is a clinician fact sheet and the consumer guide. Um, Catherine mentioned about accreditation, so there will be an advisory for assessors. But um, it's still early days, but we are looking at um, developing a monitoring tool potentially. It's in, it's in the early concept phases um, around development. We had a question from uh, Shadi, which was, why was indicator one around sepsis removed? The, the main reason there has been changes in quality statement one is that, um, as uh, we alluded to, the commission is actually developing a sepsis clinical care standard. Um, so we need to make sure that things um, will be be able to be aligned um, and certainly the sepsis clinical care standard will be um, expanded um, on top of what any quality statement in an AMS clinical care standard can offer um, and so we're expecting that to be not um, to be available in the not too far distant future um, so really we should be looking to the sepsis clinical care standard um, and the AMS standard to be aligned with that and support that. Mel Figtree has a question around surgical prophylaxis and ongoing poor performance. So she says surgical prophylaxis and increase, is um, increased priority in the new standard. Has there been surgical college engagement around expectations and performance? Thanks. It certainly has. <laughs> um, it took a while to get the College of Surgeons on board, but they're fully on board now. I do recognise this. It's, you have to look at it in the context of the fact that Generally, colleges don't tell their members what to do. <laughs> and um, 
But uh, College of Surgeons uh, has defied that trend over the years and been quite prescriptive about a number of things. So once we were able to engage members of the College, college of Surgeons, um, there's quite a lot of interest now in tackling this. Of course, it's different for different specialties. You know, your GI surgeon will have a different view from an orthopaedic surgeon. An ophthalmologist will have a totally different view. So there's, uh, it's complex um, and we'll, each of the different subspecialties will have to be tackled one at a time, I think. But remember, there are still national guidelines called therapeutic guidelines, antibiotic, sadly, <laughs> um, not antimicrobial, but uh, it's, uh, it is still a very strong pointer to uh, any surgeon anywhere, public or private. Yeah, what's appropriate. Might just add that we had a wonderful surgeon on our review group. Um, so on top of the College of Surgeons endorsing both and also the anaesthetists, ANSCA have endorsed um, the clinical standard as well as the um, College for Australasian Perioperative Nurses. So um, I guess trying to engage all the stakeholders in that process. Um, the commission has also done some separate work with the um, surgical colleagues um, within the Aura team to engage them and um, the anaesthetists to improve that. Um, but on top of John's thing, it's also trying to get the gastroenterologists who are doing um, their scopes or their, you know, liver cancer blasting, you wanting broad spectrum antimicrobials or whatever to follow the therapeutic guidelines as well. I had a question from Matthew. Given your comments about the high use of antimicrobials in the community and general practice setting, what's the intersection between the clinical care standard and that setting? Well, my immediate response to that is um, the clinical care standard is for everyone. Um, you know, IV to oral switch, is, uh, switch isn't, isn't an issue for many GPs, um, but it's uh, the principles in each of the quality statements apply across the board. And it should be seen by um, general practitioners um, and community practitioners as very much guidance for them as much as anybody else. We had a wonderful GP and dentist um, and consumer on our review group as well. So um, the commission also has a primary care committee um, that reviewed and provided feedback. Um, obviously that one that Catherine mentioned around review of therapy, it was talking about daily review, but that's not feasible in the community. And we also discussed in life-threatening infections that that might need to be more frequent. So watch this space. So another um, potential resource that we are looking at developing is a primary care guide for general practice and community pharmacy. Um, but as John says, they are under the banner of this clinical care standard and um, uh, ACRAM, um, the College of R Rural and Remote Medicine have endorsed as well as the Pharmacy Guild of Australia um, and the Pharmaceutical Society of Australia amongst a range of lots of other, Optometry Australia, the Dental Association, lots of community organisations have also read and endorsed um, the standard. A question from Ivy. Can, can the clinical care standard indicators be incorporated and aligned into the NAPs and SNAPs? I don't know if that's something that you can answer. Catherine, do you want to have a go at that? Sure. Um, so, you know, this is really highlighting how we take the clinical care standard into um, the, you know, audit floor, the feedback floor. Um, and whenever there is something developed by the commission um, which might be important across the streams of work uh, the commission is doing um, they will work to be aligned as much as possible um, but I think it's important to note that there are many platforms that people can use to audit various things and, and we should be ensuring they're aligned across uh, the breadth of what people um, we, we're aware of what people use um, and so you know it should be greater than that as well um, but I think um, I don't want to speak on behalf of the commission but uh, you know uh, in my experience that has been a priority 
I just ask a follow-up question, but I just remembered something that might be useful to when we retired 1A, that people can still use um, Indicator 1A up until the 31st of December next year. So um, no one, these are all optional. Um, you can use them or not. But Catherine, I thought I might ask you just a follow-up question. Um, so often when we've been reviewing this, um, people ask us about benchmarks or targets for the indicators. Um, and so they're not set, but I was just wondering if you could explain to the audience about... Um, why there are no benchmarks or targets for the indicators? Sure. We've touched on a few concepts already. Um, this is the clinical care standard is appropriate to many different settings. Um, and, uh, you know, the amount of patients that have an antimicrobial review within what period of time may be very different in the hospital setting versus the general practice setting. Um, so I think you need to contextualise again um, where you're heading and what's appropriate for your setting. But generally, the commission doesn't set targets. They don't collect data. They don't store data. Um, so that's not something that is part of that process. Um, but personally, I, I set my own, um, you know, if I don't have something that I'm aiming for, I don't know where I'm heading. So, um, but across the spectrum where I work and uh, many of my colleagues on here today work with me across the rural, regional and tertiary healthcare settings. And, you know, I have different goals for different settings. Um, so it's about, again, what's uh, working out what you think is optimal in your setting and working out how you're going to get there and over what time period you're going to get there. Thanks, Catherine. Sorry, I'm just scrolling up. I think we have just a couple of last questions. Uh, just had a question. Is there Are there any specific indicator that ensure nurses or other multi, multidisciplinary team stakeholders have it to ensure that nurses or other multidisciplinary team stakeholders have an active role in AMS? That might be more there. Um, the Commission also has structure indicators um, and the national standards that we're looking at, um, like I said, very early days, so no promises, um, but uh, putting into a resource around that monitoring tool. Um, but they're currently published, so there's been great work done by the Aura team at the Commission um, around structure indicators, and um, I believe so that links into both the, this clinical care standard and the national standards um, and has more of those structural process measures around multidisciplinary care. Um, none of the current indicators measure that um, there is a multidisciplinary team because we acknowledge that AMS looks different in even within hospitals um, based on resourcing, um, etc. Thanks, everyone. Uh, does anyone have any last questions that they would like to ask? Give you a moment to uh, write those in. Um, and I'll just ask the panel if they have any last comments that they would like to make before we finish up for the afternoon. No, I think from my point of view, it's been a great discussion today, um, but I would like to, again, thanks uh, to the Commission for um, allowing me to be part of the process um, and also everyone who's contributed to the process to date um, from its first edition to now. Um, I think as um, an Australian prescriber, um, this has made a significant change to the landscape in which we work um, and certainly um, it's been a privilege. Thanks, Catherine. We've just had a couple of questions come through, last minute ones. Um, there's one from Brenda around small hospitals. Is there any assistance for education, with education for this? I'm assuming you mean the, this, the clinical care standard, Brenda. No, there's nothing that the commission provides directly, is there, Fiona? Um, this is more about trying to canvas your nearby bigger institutions to come and help you out. That's always the model uh, that we support. Uh, I'd be uh, uh, thinking that if you're working in a smaller hospital, who's your next big one and whose ear can you chew on to get the education that you need? We're hoping that this video or 
portions of it as highlights might be available on the Commission's website soon. So that's something you could use in short two or three minutes highlighting different issues. Um, there's the clinician fact sheet, um, which is summarised version. It, if you read through the um, clinical care standard, um, we've tried to write um, what the quality statements mean for patients, for consumers and for health service organisations, then pulled out that information as the different fact sheets. So um, maybe the clinician fact sheet might be something that you would find useful um, and that's currently published online um, to help you with education. Um, yeah. Yeah, Brenda said with AMS itself, no pharmacist at the hospital. Brenda, I'll put a plug in for SHPA. <laughs> joining the uh, specialty practice streams, um, particularly the infectious diseases specialty practice stream. Um, there's a number of pharmacists working in this space in lots of different uh, settings, and I'm sure someone on there would be more than willing to give you some advice or share resources to help with your situation. And, and certainly, you know, um, there's many areas also working in uh, across Australia at the moment, you know, the Queensland Statewide AMS program, um, much research coming out of um, NCAS in this area. Um, so, you know, every health service will have a different process um, and it's about the organisational governance working out how best to deliver that. And when there's no pharmacist um, in our very small multi-purpose centres, it's the nurse who's there. Um, and, you know, in some centres we have um, the clinical nurse ring the infectious diseases consultant directly and, you know, um, they are upskilled and they converse at a level which is completely appropriate for antimicrobial stewardship interventions. And it's about working together to mature our health service to be able to consider this a priority at all levels. Of I put a plug in as well because um, the Commission's also written an excellent book, the um, Antimicrobial Stewardship in um, uh, the Australian Healthcare Setting, so the AMS book, which is um, very useful, talks about the role, like we talked about earlier, multidisciplinary care, um, and there's also another resource which is a table it talks about implementation of ams in different contexts so um, at a state level hospital level um, sm smaller hospital level even day procedure centers so um, i would suggest that you um, go and have a check that out mm. and also one of our one of my colleagues and members also uh, reminded me that i'd need to plug our rural and remote specialty practice stream as well um, mm -hmm. Again, they'll have lots of resources to support people. Uh, so we've got one more moment. Last question, Sonia, for sneaking in. Um, so obviously the clinical care standards are well known in the hospital setting. How are you disseminating these new standards to the community? Oops. Dropped out there for a minute, Carly. Oh, sorry. I heard you. Um, it's about dissemination of the clinical care centres to the community. I guess all those things that we've mentioned. So um, the Commission has a primary care committee which has uh, leaders from all across Australia, from the Royal Australian College of General Practice. Um, uh, we've written to all those um, organisations. We're developing the primary care fact sheet, um, but there is ongoing work um, to engage the um the community setting um, from general practice, community pharmacy, and also non-medical prescribers like dental optometry. Um, I think I counted last, there was over a dozen community organisations that had endorsed the standard as well. And part of that endorsement means that they disseminate the standard to their members um, and make it available. But we acknowledge that um, increased work to make sure that these are feasible in the community um, was needed and that work's um, currently undergoing and um, ongoing. Thanks, Fiona. Um, so it's now two o'clock. So I will thank you all for your participation and thank you to Catherine, John and Fiona for uh, being with us today and sharing their expertise and providing us with that great overview of the updated clinical care standard.